Hello and welcome to our second video now where we are still looking at calculating these probabilities of a type 2 error and we're still looking at a one-tailed test. Yes, we will do a two-tailed test. It's a little bit different, but very similar. So once again, I'm, I'm just expanding on an earlier problem a nine, from 9.1c. Here we were looking at um, this car sales manager that developed a new incentive program to try to increase sales. So you remember, and I'm not going through all of those aspects of that first test. Of course, we can see that in the video for 9.1c. But here I have my null and alternative hypotheses to determine whether or not we were successful at increasing sales. Historical sales were 96 cars per year. So that's that hypothesized value. Was I successful at increasing sales? Meaning, do I have evidence to show that the population mean now is greater than 96? Yes or no. So this was the test from 9.1c, and we did this test at the 05 level of significance. Purpose of this video is to now go through practicing how to calculate the probability of a type 2 error. Remember, a type 2 error is that we falsely accept the null. So it means that the alternative is true, but our evidence supports the null hypotheses. Now, if you go back and see this problem, well, you'll see that we had a p-value here of 0.7. Uh, 0 0.07, which led us to not reject. So we may have committed a type 2 error there. We don't know. We might have. Because when you fail to reject, you're either correct or you've committed a type 2. Now, knowing the probability or calculating the probability of a type 2 error is a bit of just a technical exercise. Because to actually calculate the probability of a type 2 error means that the alternative is true and you know by exactly how much it's true. Right? To calculate these type 2 errors, I have to know what the actual population mean is. If I knew that, why am I doing any testing in the first place? So calculating the probability of a type 2 error is really reliant on having a piece of information that we don't have. So the point of doing this is not so much to, to know how to calculate that probability. It's to understand how that probability changes with the proximity of reality to your hypothesized value. If the alternative is true, but just barely, meaning you know maybe the actual population mean is 96.1, so the alternative is true, but just barely, it's going to be really difficult for me to identify that because it's so close. So I'm more likely to commit a type 2 error if the alternative is just barely true. If the alternative is true and the actual population mean is 200, so it's really true. Well, that's going to be easier to identify. I'll, it'll be easier for me to reject the null hypotheses if the alternative is very true. So that's why it's important to understand type 2 error and 1 minus the type 2 error, which is the power of the test. And of course, the power of the test is telling me the probability of correctly rejecting a false null. So, now let's go through these exercises. I'm going to go through a little bit faster, again, because this is the second one that we've done on this topic. The first thing that we need to do before I can get into calculating probabilities is to really figure out a little bit more information about my rejection space. To know what are the values for a sample mean that will lead me to reject or not. So, as we know from doing the few tests that we've already done, we always operate under this assumption 
that HO is true with equality, right? I'm not gonna put the number in just yet. I'll put numbers in just a second. Here's that hypothesized value. So then everything that we've done so far, we, we draw a sample. So here's some sample X bar. We would standardize that sample or normalize that value so that we have a Z score. This is getting really messy. So here I have a Z score. And then we would compare that Z score against some critical value. So then I have, let's say here's my critical value, Z alpha. And that critical value defines, this is a little bit small, if my test statistic for this upper tail test, if my test statistic was larger than that, I would reject. If my test statistic was smaller than that, well, for the sake of a two tail conversation, let's say accept. So if it's smaller than that, here, this I will accept. Okay, so that's typical hypothesis testing, right? That's what we've been doing so far in our tests. The first step in calculating these type 2 probabilities is not to go from an X bar to a Z and then compare to a critical value. What we want to do is start with that Z, that critical Z, and find what is the corresponding X bar star, the corresponding value for the sample mean that corresponds with that critical value. Because if I have that X bar star, well, what that means is that any sample mean greater than X bar star that's going to result in a test statistic greater than that critical value, and I would reject. Any sample mean that is less than X bar star is going to result in a test statistic that is less than that critical value. And here I would then accept. Again, I'm putting accept in quotation marks only because we're specifically having a discussion about a type 2 error. We would never say accept, right? We would say we're unable to reject. We do not reject the null hypotheses. So before I can calculate any probabilities, I first need to figure out what is this X bar star. So we start with this formula that we have used a few times before, but now I want to solve for that X bar. And I know what that Z is. So we're going in the opposite direction. So if I fill this in, our test here, again, we're doing this test at the 05 level of significance. So we already know, because we've already done a couple of exercises, we know that that critical value would be 1.645. I'm solving for X bar star. Our hypothesized value here was 96. Our standard deviation, well here, this was the one earlier on that was a little bit tricky because it's giving us the population variance. So I don't want to put the variance unless I adjust my formula. I want the standard deviation. So if the variance is 49, our standard deviation here is 7, divided by the square root of our sample size, which is 26. Now I'm just going to rearrange this so that I can solve for that value that I am interested in. X bar star is going to be 1.645, 7 over root 26 plus 96. I take out my calculator. I, I think I might have had an answer just right there. Oops. 1.645 times 7 over root. This is not going to go through properly. Let's go through this way. 7 divided by root 26 
times 1.645 plus 96. There we go. 98 point, let's call it 98.3. So my x bar star is 98.3. Oh, what does that mean? So that is this value from my assumed distribution, 98.3. Let's put in our hypothesized value now, which was 96. So what I know now is that any sample that I draw from the population of some equal sample size, of course, 26, if I draw a sample, if it has a mean greater than 98.3, that is going to give me a test statistic greater than, whoops, a test statistic greater than my critical value there, which was 1.645. So a sample mean greater than 98.3 is going to lead me to reject. A sample mean less than 98.3 is going to lead me to accept. Okay, so again, just like this here was that area alpha, here I have that area alpha. Okay, and that's important to keep in mind for something to come a little bit later. Finally, after all of this, now we can get into dealing with our question. What if the actual population mean is 100? So again, I can see that satisfies the alternative. What is the probability that if it's actually 100, that I incorrectly support the null hypotheses? So if it's 100, let's just come down a little bit, clear some of this mess. If it's 100, it looks something like this. I don't know exactly where it is. I don't have to be totally precise, but it's somewhere out here. So there's my 100. So if that's what it actually is, that's the population distribution. What is the probability then that I draw a sample that falls into my acceptance space? So I'm going to drop a line down here. There's 98.3 in that distribution. The probability that I draw a sample from this distribution that lies in my acceptance region is, of course, the probability that I draw a sample from this distribution less than 98.3. Because I know a sample with a mean less than 98.3 is going to result in a test statistic that leads me to accept. This area here is my beta. My probability of committing a type 2 error if the actual population mean is 100. How do we calculate that? It's like so many other things. I need to standardize it. I have 98.3 minus 100 divided by that same standard error, which was 7 over root 26. I'm going to pull up my calculator. 98.3 minus 100 divided by 7 over root 26. So that gives me negative 1, 2, 4. Okay, so what? Well, now we go to our Z tables. And I want that lower probability. I want that lower tail probability. And so luckily that's what our tables give us. They're all giving us lower tail probabilities. Negative 1.2. And I'm going to come over here. There's 4. So there's that probability in the lower tail. 0.1075.
So that means here, my probability of committing a type 2 error, I'm just going to keep it simple, let's just say it's 11. My probability of committing a type 2 error if the actual population mean is 100 is 11%. Meaning that if the actual population mean is 100, there's an 11% chance that I draw a sample from that distribution that is going to fall into my acceptance space. The power of my test is 1 minus beta, which here is going to be 0 0.89. Well, that's this region out here. That is the probability of drawing a sample if my distribution has a, if my population has a distribution with a mean of 100, there's an 89% chance that I draw a sample from that distribution that falls into my rejection space. So that is the probability of correctly rejecting a false null. Again, if that population mean is 100, that satisfies my alternative. The probability of drawing a sample from that distribution that satisfies that, sorry, the probability of drawing a sample from that distribution that leads to a rejection that falls into that rejection space is 89%. Good. So, if the actual population mean is 100, there's an 11% chance that I will incorrectly accept. There's an 89% chance that I will correctly reject that false null. Okay, let's quickly go through the next one here. Now I'm looking at what if it's 99. Okay, so now it's a little bit closer. Let's just move these. That first one, I had a beta of 0.11. Now we're going to move that distribution over just a little bit. We're at, I think I said 99. Yeah. So I'm just over here now. Didn't move over much. And so now I'm dropping this value down, and I want to know what is this probability. That's my beta. This is that 98.3 in this distribution. We standardize that, 98.3 minus 99 over that standard error. 98.3 minus 99, 7 over root 26, negative, oops, negative 0.51. Negative 0.51. Okay, so now we want to go to our Z tables and figure out what that probability is. Negative 0.51, here's negative 0.5. This is going to be 0.51. Yes, bring that down just to be sure. 0.3, let's call it 0.31. So again, the probabilities aren't the point. Because calculating those probabilities is reliant on having some piece of information that we'll never have. The point is understanding what those probabilities mean. That probability of incorrectly accepting a false null. If the actual mean is 99, my alternative is true. My alternative is true, 
But if that's what that distribution looks like, there's a 31% chance that from that distribution, I'll draw a sample that is going to lead me to not reject. Now, certainly, we can also look at the power of that test, and I can see 1 minus beta, so 1 minus 0.31 is 0.69, and so I can see that if the actual population has a mean of 91, there's a 69% chance that I'll draw a sample that will lead me to correctly reject. Don't get hung up on the probabilities recognize how those probabilities change when the distance between the actual population mean and your hypothesized value change. As that value gets closer to our hypothesized value, the probability of committing a type 2 error increases. When that distance is very small, it becomes very difficult to identify it. It becomes very difficult to correctly reject the null if the alternative is only just barely true. If the alternative is very true, if the distance is large, then it becomes much easier to identify it. Your power increases, your exposure to a type 2 error decreases. Okay, and finally, what if the actual mean is 95? So once again, you want to go through all of these calculations. You're going to want to move this distribution over to here. Right, and you're going to drop this value down, and then you're going to want to calculate all of this probability. Oh my goodness, what a waste of time. Don't get into a routine of, of recognizing a problem and then thinking you know what you're supposed to do. That's what students will do all the time. They'll see, okay, I want to calculate a type 2 error. Here's that other alternative mu. Okay, and, you know, especially in an exam, you're maybe stressed, you're under pressure. You jump right into that process. Without first asking yourself, hey, what is a type 2 error? A type 2 error is accepting a false null, right? A false null. Well, if the actual population mean is 95, well, my null is not false. If the actual mean is 95, my null is correct. If my null is correct, my exposure to a type 2 is 0, because a type 2 is accepting it when it's false. If it's correct, you'll never commit a type 2 error. Okay, good. That's it for part F. So once more, I've dragged on for 23 minutes on calculating these type 2 probabilities. That's long enough. Time to take a break. So I'll pause here. I'll come back with a fresh video to look at part H. Okay, thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.